This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hello, welcome back to Dune Talk. So we are celebrating this week. We have some exciting news to talk about. You probably know what, what I'm referring to, and we'll get into that in uh, just a moment. Uh, this is Marcus Gabriel, your editor at DuneNewsNet.com. Um, I'm here today with Johnny. Yes, I'm back. I feel like I haven't been on here in forever. I don't know why. It's probably because there's been so much Dune happening in the meantime. Um, yeah, Johnny Subject here on Twitter, of course. For those of you that know me, uh, I'm excited to dive into, yes, big news and uh, some other fun things to discuss this week. This is Garen. Uh, glad to be back again. And we're excited to kind of uh, go deep into the under layers of Denise's creation here. So I love doing that with these guys. Hey, Simon. Um, Dowdy here. Super excited. Um, I hate it that this news came out right as we were editing the last show. That's why sometimes there's a little delay, but let's let's start talking, boys. There's a lot of awesome stuff. Yeah, so without further ado, let's just go straight into Dune Movie News. Dune Movie News. So the first story this week is we are getting Dune Part 2. So let me be honest, I am not surprised at all, <laughs> but I am uh, really happy with, with how, they, uh, how they announced this. I thought it was, uh, was good timing. Uh, so let me start with you, Johnny. We, we had uh, discussed before about, you know, like, would they announce it even before the, the US uh, premiere or, or not? And then we were saying, okay, they, they definitely have a plan in terms of timing. What, what, what do you think about how, how the announcement came? Uh, we just talked uh, endlessly, it seems like, about uh, <laughs> the potential of of everything you know what was going to happen and the a potential announcement in the box office and what it would justify it and all these other things and um you know finally it came out it did really well it overperformed again pretty much like it had been everywhere else it overperformed in the us and did pretty well on hbo max and uh so yeah on monday everyone was like just announce it just announce that we're getting you know part two um, even though it's still early in the process, you can kind of, you know, you can make projections and kind of see where it's going. And, um, you know, I was a little surprised that we didn't get anything on Monday. Um, but in the back of my head, I was always thinking all along, like, you know, I'm sure they've discussed it in detail and they're kind of like, but there's a lot to hash out. There's a lot to decide who's going to pay for what, um, what's the distribution plan going to be like all these other things to consider when, when would the release date be? Would you have a release date already planned? Um, you know, Villeneuve himself has to make, you know, has to sign off on all this because he's the one that has to make the movie. So if he's not happy with it, then it would take longer to figure out and all that. Um, so yeah, Tuesday afternoon rolls around and it just popped up. I saw it on my Twitter notification, legendary tweeted something, I think it said it was the, this is only the beginning and it was like dot 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 and I was like hold up because <laughs> they I was I was very surprised one thing that kind of that was the most surprising before this was there was no activity on Monday at all from the social media accounts and I, I thought that was very strange because of course it's the biggest movie in the world right now usually you put that out into the the sphere and you kind of you know, champion that and, and brag about it. And there was nothing. And I was like, hmm. I was like, I, I feel like there's something to that. So of course this came out and they're like, you know, thanks for all the support. So happy to like, that's going to continue. And if that was, you know, that was not it. It was not just a simple tweet. They had the logo, the, the title card with part two explicitly on there. And then moments after that, we also got uh, reports from the trades saying, this is what they agreed to. Villeneuve's, you know, he's coming back to write, direct, produce. He is, um, you know, the no HBO Max this time around, which of course we already pretty much knew that because they're not going to do that next year anyway. And this movie's not coming out next year. It's coming out even uh, further away. So we got that. Then they said October, 2023. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Like, <laughs> thank thankfully, because I was concerned. I mean, the average time between big franchise films or just films in general for most filmmakers is like three years. So I was thinking, oh man, but you do have to consider they've had a year extra technically because it was supposed to come out last year. So he's been able to work on the script probably. John Spates is working on the script. He mentioned that the production designer is working on concepts for the movie. Hans Zimmer has been working on music for the movie. So all these people involved have really still been working on it and thinking about it, looking towards part two. 
uh, which is always really encouraging. And then we actually got a specific date um, of October 20th, 2023. So I couldn't be happier. It, I thought it was perfect. Um, all the big ca- you know, cast and principal people in the crew and everything were posting on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And it, it was, it was just like this jubilant, like I've never seen social media, especially on Twitter and in the film Twitter, like community at least be so happy and, and all in agreement about something happening. Like that never happens. I don't think Twitter's ever been happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone was arguing for once. I think it was like, I guess Paul Mordi did bring peace to Twitter. And then, um, <laughs> Yeah, I saw that and I had a little tear. I was like, oh crap, it's official. <laughs> I was like, okay. And my second re- reaction was like, well, I guess we're we're doing a second season of Dune Talk. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um I'm I'm super excited. Uh the release date, that can probably change. Who knows? You know, they give you a time and I'm sure, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything, you know, COVID will be more under control by then. And the HBO Max then makes perfect sense. They even said it next year, a slate of movies, like you said, Johnny, are not going to be on HBO Max. But let the fan casting start and, and the hype. So I love it. That whole day, it was like Christmas morning to me. Just everyone was <laughs> excited. You could see people responding. Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer. I, first, I saw your your uh, tweet, Johnny, and and I tweeted out, and then I I saw Hans Zimmer tweet out about it, and I was just like, you know, I I kind of knew. I think you said it, Johnny. I kind of knew this is going to happen, but gosh, I I started kind of getting into a worst case scenario. You know, what if what if something goes wrong, or the studios have some you know problem with how it's doing or something, but. No, I, I knew it was going to happen. And so seeing that was just a huge relief, but it was almost like this, this dam breaking of all this excitement and all this energy. And, and even today, you know, seeing a lot of the, the stuff around uh, Denis talking about his vision and, and wanting even more. And I just, it's just, it's exciting to be a part of this. I, I just thought, how, what, what a great day and age to be on social media and to be a part of a movie like this and just have it kind of go to the moon. It was really exciting. I, I loved every minute of it. We have an exact date at the moment, which it, it, it could change, but I think uh, the way it was announced, so October 20, 2023, it seems that they have a lot of uh, confidence in, in that window. Thinking about like uh, Denis Villeneuve's earlier comments where he, where he was, uh, you know, this was before there was official announcement, like I think two, two or three months back, even before Venice and uh, Denis was talking about how he would have already been working on writing uh, the script, which we know that uh, he was working together with, with John Spates. And he was saying that, yeah, Dune could uh, could start shooting as, as early as fall 2022. Do you think that's going to move up? We know the first film shot for like three and a half months or so. And of course, by the time they finished, they had well over a year to do post-production because at that point, it was still coming out in December 2020. Um and, you know, I, I, you know, as you mentioned, Villeneuve had said, well, we'll know by December if we're going to do it or not, like in a worst case scenario kind of situation where if they have to really kind of calculate it out, but it's been very positive. It's been overwhelmingly positive. So they could just say it now. Don't even have to wait till November. Like it's, it's, it's out there. And I think that they have, of course, been talking a lot about it already behind the scenes. I mean, there was that little clip from Venice when they, they were on the red carpet. And Chalamet was like, hey, like <laughs> he was talking to the producers. He's talking to Legendary and Warner Brothers. And they're all like, well, we're doing it. Like we're doing a part two. Like that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, to have it official, official, it feels good. And Warner Brothers is back. They, they're not backing out. They're not telling Legendary go somewhere else with this because, you know, you cost us or something like that. No, they are happy with it. They want to continue and be a part of this story and this team. And I think that's awesome. And it's funny because last week, I think it was, and they're having all that Good Morning America stuff. Brolin said that, oh, next summer, we're probably, we're, we'll be back over there working and like making the next one. And that was before it had even come out in theaters in the US. So uh, he, of course, must have heard something or was talking to people and there was, there was bullishness about it. The, the great thing about this is they have already done this before. So they have everything streamlined. They have everything planned out. Of course, there are going to be new elements to decide on and, and new elements that are part of this movie that weren't necessarily in the first one, but the basics are there. Between now and next summer, it'll be 
full on pre-production, full on development, r- finishing the script, um, going through those drafts, uh, all the concept artists doing, you know, that have been doing work on probably on this movie will continue to do that. Production designer, Patrice Vermette, I'm sure he'll be back. He'll start to work. Um, and, you know, same thing with costume, makeup, hair, makeup. Uh, Greg Frazier is returning as well. We already knew Hans Zimmer, we know would be back. So that's all great news. You're going to have that visual and sonic consistency from part one to part two. There's not going to be any difference there. And uh, and so, yeah, I'm just super happy about it. Um, you know, I already mentioned that. But I think, yeah, between now and then, it's going to be in casting, of course. That's another thing. Fan casting, Simon mentioned it. Um, you know, of course, that's going to be something. I, I That was one of the first things I'd screwed. I was like, oh, man, I have all these people in my head. Um, but there, it, it's going to be fun. It's going to be really fun because now before it was like, oh, all this casting, it was all these, this all-star cast they were putting together. And of course that got people excited and got people's attention. But now it's like, oh man, we loved Dune. Like, and a lot of other people love Dune now and they saw the movie and maybe didn't even have any expectations of loving it. Now, when any news drops about this next movie, they're like, oh my God, like it's this person or oh my God, it's going to be, it's this role. Like that's interesting. So it's just going to be, it's going to be even more amplified. I think part two is going to be bigger, better, uh and and bolder and and will just be more interesting and, and exciting so at, at every stage and i'm excited to uh go through that journey again like you said two less than two years so you know it, it could be of course that it opens with uh with paul and they're going to see us but i think it will also be interesting as, as we mentioned about like you, you know we, we've we've uh, left paul and, and jessica and, and the fremen in this uh position you know where we know they're going to the CS but we don't know yet what's ahead I think it would be really interesting as mentioned like you know start with the Harkonnens like uh, have the arena scene in the beginning go straight into the action that then go to Kaitain and show the show the emperor and then at that point people are really with full of anticipation like you know what's happening with Paul and then you go over to the CH and water of life but yeah I, I mean there's just so much ways uh to to start this this movie um yeah like r- really excited to, to see what they're going to do and, and yeah as mentioned like, it begins like now two years that we can um we can speculate and discuss and have have theories like in a, in a positive way so uh yeah and of course we're going to get like a lot of uh news uh, ho- hopefully starting uh early next next year like whether it's the casting or other announcements in terms of new stuff for part two what are you most hoping to hear casting is a big one right i, I, I care about these characters so much i want to make sure i don't have Denis choose someone that I'm not very excited about. I mean, you know, who am I? But that's what I kind of <laughs> care about. Um, I, I think, I think I just implicitly trust Denis. I just do. I just, I, I'm not that worried about it. I, I think I'm excited about um, how epic. It, I, I know I've already tweeted out kind of a comparison to Return of the King, but this is going to have epic. I mean, capital mm. word, capital letters, <laughs> epic battles and and stuff on a on a grand scale that these these people that don't know Dune they have no idea what's coming, right? <laughs> and and so how much he's going to allow that epic scale to come through and yet still stay focused on these characters because mm. Denis is so good at character development. Um, I I love how we've talked on this podcast before about he allows these moments of interaction for these characters to breathe for us to breathe as we're watching the characters develop so i I guess i'm looking forward most in casting and also how epic he's gonna allow this to be and how to keep that balance with the characters i I love his his comments about how uh that part two is going to be the the main course uh, in a way like uh just like think about like how how good part one is you know I mean I mean of course there 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 are areas where you know there were scenes that, that weren't in it and there, there there could have been like other things that we could have explored but just part one it was like so epic already and like to imagine that part two it's there's even more potential to go um, to a grander scale like I'm just thinking about like epic yeah definitely because we've we've seen in the in the still tense uh, sequence with the visions of you know what are the possible futures and you see the the battle. Uh, like of the the, the Fremen uh, uh, fight, fighting against the the Sardaukar on the plains, and you see the the sandworm. Like uh, imagine that that battle of Arakeen, like a full full blown like a like a battle of, at Helm's Deep, uh, like in in uh, in Lord of the Rings, like that scale, like that that go, goes on for a long time, and you get to, to like have the emotion and all these characters that you you've now been following and you've been introduced to them over a course of uh, a one movie. I've, yeah, really exciting. You know, Marcus, rest assured, though, 
Denis is not going to do this like Peter Jackson. I mean, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. I think those are an achievement in cinema. But Denis is very different. He tells a very different type of story in a very different way. And, and so the epicness, I want it to, to be exciting for me as a fan. I've, I've read the book a number of times and those, those images are ingrained in my mind and, I, and my imagination made them epic. But I, I know the way he's going to do it is not going to overshadow the character uh, arcs. And, and so, again, like I said, I just trust that he's going to do it right. I like what you said, Johnny. You tweeted out about how there should really be no limits on race, ethnic background, anything for the emperor, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I really hope Denis, and I think he will, he's, he's mature enough of a director. He's going to make the choice that he feels best about. He's not going to do some token, you know, casting for some region of the, of the planet, you know, to, to get more uh, audience. Um, but I really hope he continues with the diversity of the character, the cast that he's had. And, and I guess I really, to answer your question again, Marcus, I guess I really care about who he's going to cast as the emperor because that role is enormous in the second half. I think it is the emperor for me um, because Fade is a big, big character. Um, he is like that kind of, you know, broken mirror uh, of Paul that is really important. And, and there's a lot of like bigger names I feel like you can really get for that. Um, yeah. Uh, and whereas with the emperor, I mean, it could literally be anyone really. Um, and that was one of the, as I commented on yesterday, I think that's really exciting because I have the fan cast I've heard already. have just been like literally all over the map from age, from, you know, thirties to seventies to, um, you know, black, white, uh, Benicio del Toro is a name that I heard that I really liked. Um, it, it's just been, yeah, it's been all over the place. So that but it is a big one because I was very much not shocked or necessarily like surprised, but I thought they really placed a lot of emphasis on the Emperor in this first movie. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminded me almost like of Star Wars, where you know, you know that Darth Vader is not like the big bad, there's someone else that's going to be coming. Um, and so and and it's gonna be interesting because again, with the with the character of the Emperor, it's not just his the demographic of the actor necessarily but how they can play that character because they're of course the most powerful person in the, the universe um because they are the emperor but they, they are clearly very insecure and jealous and there's there in that way they have a limited amount of power as well so it's, you have to have an actor that can kind of play both sides of that almost to make it believable um Another name that I heard was Ben Mendelsohn. Uh, from you know, most people probably know him from Rogue One. He was the bad, the bad guy in that movie, um, and with with the Empire. And he's just kind of like a smaller, like older kind of like he seems almost like kind of like feeble at times the way he can play himself. And like that's just so totally opposite from someone like you know a Benicio del Toro or like Mahershala Ali or these other names that you've heard tossed around. Charles Dance, of course, is another one that you have seen or heard before, like the Game of Thrones connection there. Um, yeah, so it's it's really really exciting, and they could cast they could cast a, a very little known actor as well as the Emperor, and I think just have them play, you know, because at that at that point you don't attach anything to them they can just play it however it needs to be played and there's no other associations with their name or their face or anything so yeah and that's the same thing it goes for Irulan like Princess Irulan because she's gonna of course need to have some sort of connection to the emperor at least you know as far as race and ethnicity goes um you're probably gonna want to align those to some degree I have three people that I actually just thought of as potential actors bear with me <laughs> Lawrence Fishberg okay I feel like he has that Shakespearean kind of then. Kenneth Branagh. I can see that. Yeah. Kenneth Branagh, I feel like is a pretty good choice. And here's a crazy one Sir <laughs> Ben Kingsley. Oh, okay. I can see that too. <laughs> I actually like all three of those. No, I, I, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought of those. Um, but like I, those are great ideas because I think all, all three of those can kind of play that they're they clearly are powerful or have been powerful but they are kind of like losing it or they're kind of like it's slipping from their grasp and there's this younger person coming up there there is a lot of directions that they could uh, go and i i do have the feeling like just as uh, 
you know, based on the other interviews we, we've seen from, from Villeneuve that he probably has like either a specific someone in mind or he at least has a short list by now. Uh, speaking of, of timings, like uh, Johnny, when, when would you expect like these, um, at least these main roles to get filled? Like when we talk about the Emperor, Fade, Irlan? They started filming, I believe it was in March, 2019. Uh, and then, but it was in the summer of 2018 when Chalamet got cast. And then going into the fall, Rebecca Ferguson, Oscar Isaac, and then the rest kind of filled out through the rest of the of the fall at the end of, of 2018. So, and a few, a few months later, they were there and filming. So I, I would expect if they're filming in next summer, probably spring, springtime would be what I imagine. Of course, as I mentioned, they're on a different sort of track or timeline this time around. Um, given that they have already been through it already once, there's a lot less they have to figure out as far as casting and as far as production and all those things. So it's possible we hear about it before then, but I, I would expect they're going to take the next few months to finish the script, of course, get all that stuff done. And then once they have, maybe they're, they're talking about, you know, concepts and, and, and who they would imagine in, in costume and, and different things like that. Um, then they'll they'll come out with those. So I would I would say early next year, probably first few months of next year. So in the past uh, two episodes, we've we've been focusing on uh, you know our overreactions to seeing the movie many many times, <laughs> and now um, uh, last episode we covered the first twenty four minutes of the movie, and uh, the next scene that we were going to talk about is the the Gondra Bar scene, and uh, Denis Villeneuve has uh, yeah uh, had a really in-depth uh, commentary it was uh, i think over 17 uh, minutes where he actually took a marker and was writing things on on the screen and uh, explained the, the scene in, in depth uh i'll start with with you garen what, what was your big takeaway from uh from the director's commentary yeah first of all this was just like candy to me i, I could not get enough of this thing i watched it over and over because it's it's really exciting to feel like you're sitting in the room with the director and he's he's going under the surface to the thinking that he has behind each one of these shots, the setup, the symbolism, uh, the, you know, even, even things related to, you know, he, he wanted uh, the Reverend mother to, to be like a chess piece, you know, the symbol of a, of a chess piece checking uh, Paul in this situation, you know, overpowering him. So um, again, I, I just, I'm just in awe. I mean, I thought I knew that, that Denis really was a fan of the book and really uh, just wants to create this world to be as accurate as possible. But I did not realize to the degree that he wants to reflect the book. He even says in there, I think more than one time, I want Frank Herbert to see this film and to be pleased. I've seen these uh, segments before. I really like these when they do them. Um, I know there was one with Matt Reeves on the last plan of the apes movie that I, I remember watching with him. And it was, it's just so interesting. Cause he's another comparable filmmaker where he literally, he thinks of every single aspect that you could possibly think of. And he's so meticulous and he has uh, such a high thinking of why he's doing something, uh, not just technically, but emotionally and like how that's going to translate to the audience. So when I saw this popped up, I was like, oh, yeah, like I'm, I'm ready to watch this. And I, I liked that they chose this scene because this is, of course, a pivotal scene, an iconic scene from the book. And there's a lot going on here technically, but then also with the performances. And so there's there's a lot to digest. And as Garen said, yeah, he, he really does. Uh, you you can sense the passion and you can sense the the deep thinking and and just how I mean, for example, one thing that really struck me because it was something he was talking about early on in the segment and it never crossed my mind, but he said, you know, we were thinking how, when he, when she calls him over, how are we going to, how are we going to show that exactly? Because if you do it, I mean, it's, it's a big room. <laughs> so he's, and he's like, I didn't want him to walk over there like a zombie. Like he was just like, you know, just like marching like awkwardly or just stoically kind of going over there strangely. And so it was like, how can you, how can we do that? And, and then he was like, it's almost like a, like a mini coma. Like you just, it takes you over and then you pop back out on the other side and you don't even need to see him get over there. They do the dolly zoom, they pull back, you know, the, they turn, they turn the lights down on the side. Practically. It's not some sort of, you know, masking effect that they do in the, in the edit. And then you cut to the next shot and he's just, he's dropping to his knees right there. And he's already at, at the seat. Like it's just all those little things. Like I never would have even have thought about that. Um, and so he, he talks about the costumes. He talks about the lighting, the the focus, the the shot choice, the composition. 
it's just, yeah, I, I could watch this over and over again. And I could watch hours of him talking about this movie. I mean, scene by scene. I also really loved the the moment where he discusses the burning hand in the box and how it was like basically totally practical. Like they actually they had some burnt wood and then they had this hand that they made and then they kind of like digitally, you know, plastered that over it. I thought that was just really interesting and, and something that I, again, never would have thought of. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was great. I would certainly recommend anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about or hasn't seen it yet, go and watch it. Um, Cause it is a nice little almost 20 minute uh, clip where you can just really get a sense of, of all the thoughts that go into making not just the movie as a whole, but any individual scene or moment and, and get a sense of also Villeneuve as, as a director and also as a personality, because his personality is definitely on display when he's talking about this and makes it makes for a fun little little watch. I was super impressed about the dolly thin, how they did that. I thought that was just like a transition in Final Cut or whatever Joe Walker uses. I was like, oh, crap, they actually did that with a dolly. That more practical effects, you know, it's an easy um action in final cut to do but i'm like they they did it they shot it you know the chess piece then like i was telling you guys before we recorded i didn't even realize that and it dune is a giant game of chess you know when you really think about it and it's just the small little details and Denis is the biggest fanboy i've ever seen and i love when he breaks down the box just by itself how he explains how it's a power play that it faces this way and that way. And I actually want one of the box. I actually <laughs> went on Etsy and see if I can find someone that made a box. But it's just, yeah, uh, Warner Brothers, when you release this on home release, I don't care. I don't care if it's 14 hours long. Please have Denis break down some more scenes. Yeah, and uh, I, I want to touch on um, the previous point. So just, just so that everybody is aware, when when we do these shows, we have the show notes and we have links to the, to all the, the stories. Uh, so for example, for, for this piece, uh, James had, had written an article on the site and the, the YouTube videos is there as well. Um, so th th there was, yeah, I think there, there's a uh, way he described this is that this scene contains layers upon layers. There's just so much depth to just this, this one scene. Um, one of the, the big, big parts of this is understanding the power of the Bene Gesserit, because we talked about this in the, in the last episode when we had a scene where this, the ceremony with the, with the Trades and we get introduced to the sort of the power dynamic in the, in the Dune uh, universe, in the, in the Imperium. And we were introduced to, you know, the different um, like stages of the human evolution, the different schools, basically. Uh, so we, we had uh, the, the Mentats and we got to see Tufer Hawat making his, his calculation. Uh, we got to see the, 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 the guilds uh, members and we saw them with their their orange masks and you know we, we didn't see their their actual ability in, in action but we understand that they they needed to uh, to be there in order to transport uh, the the highliners across uh, space and then we saw the the Bene Gesserit and you know we saw that interplay uh, between the Reverend Mother and Lady Jessica but we didn't get an idea of you know what's what's their true power like uh, of course we had the, the breakfast scene where where Paul tries to use the voice. But then immediately in this voice, uh, in this uh, scene, it establishes like how powerful this, this organization is, like not only in the background politi politically, but they do have these uh, superhuman powers. Like when we see the voice, I remember like the first time I saw it in the in a teaser, I was just like taken back, like, whoa, you know, this, this is uh, incredible. So you see like Paul entered this room and like he's with someone who has, you know, like who has uh, honed their, their powers for uh, 60, 70 uh, years, because this is a really... Uh, senior member of the, of the Bene Gesserit. Uh, and then one of the other layers is, of course, we get to see Paul. Like when, when he enters the, the, the room, like he's he's unsure of it himself. He, he has no idea what's going to happen to him that night. He, you know, he gets a quick warning from Dr. Huey, but he walks in that and he's completely powerless. But then I love how uh, Denis Villeneuve described how there was a transition. Like in the beginning, he puts his hand in the box. He's trapped like an, like an animal. Uh, but as the scene gr grows on, at a certain point, he's he's in con control, and then like um, uh, Re Reverend Mother Moheim is is actually you know almost backing off. Like she, you know, it's 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 too much. So I just love that uh, uh, that that whole transition across the scene. The thing that I really loved about this breakdown with with Villeneuve is how he describes the intercut between Jessica standing outside the door and Paul with his hand in the box, and how you know to to someone who isn't familiar with this story to get the full gravity of the situation. I mean, 
Reverend Mother Mohayam does say, you pull your hand out and you're going to die. I'm going to kill you with this with this needle. But to see uh, Lady Jessica outside just almost completely losing control of herself, and she uses the litany of fear, which we get to know really well in this film, which I'm really grateful for. She uses that to actually calm down. And we, we witness her calming down her, her emotions, going from completely out of control to being composed. And that really lends itself to being like, wow, Paul is in grave danger here. If, if Lady Jessica is panicked here, this is a really serious situation. Uh, one thing I love is also Paul's reaction as he's taking control. And as you can see, again, Joe Walker, please give him the Oscar for editing. You know, as you can see, Paul getting more, I guess, more confident with himself and overcoming his fear and Jessica doing the litany of fear at the same time. You really see Paul quiz at Hazarat show up. And that's when I was like, oh, okay, Xiaomi is... It's going to bring it to the scene. And I remember when we saw this scene a couple of months ago, Garen, I remember you just said it felt like he was transported right away to her. You know, it's, it's such the iconic scene that I don't want to say it's one of my favorite scenes. It's like saying, oh, I love Goodfellas because it's the cool guy movie to like at a certain point in our lives. But it's such an amazing scene. And seeing this little feature with Denis breaking it down made me even enjoy this scene even more. Is a really great example of how Hans Zimmer's music just seamlessly plays into the drama of this film. When, when Paul begins to go from being in so much pain that he's almost cowering in front of the Reverend Mother to kind of looking up at her and almost gaining the upper hand, even though he's the one experiencing the pain, and then the music just like crescendos right in that moment. That is such a satisfying moment to me because you, you usually don't notice Hans Zimmer's music because it, again, it just blends so well. And, and that's what you want. But in that moment, it tells you something. It's like, he's in control now. She's worried. And real quick, <laughs> I know we've been talking about this for so long. I just keep thinking of new details. He mentions that they're, they originally wanted her to, at some point to like lift her veil or like take her veil off. I, I rewatching it after hearing that, I think maybe after Jessica comes back in potentially or something like that. But um, I, I can like, I can't imagine her not wearing it now. Cause it, of course, when they're probably looking at the playback on set and whatnot, they see, I mean, once you have those close ups of her with the veil on and it's still so powerful <laughs> and her eyes are so striking, it's like, why, why even try to take it off? Like, it's just, it's so strong anyway. Um, so again, those little, those little things that, that help make those decisions or, or push him to make certain choices. It's just endlessly interesting because there's, and it really seems like there's endless directions in any given moment as a filmmaker, you can go. And so how they end up making the final choices that they do is always, you know, it's a very uh, intriguing. Yeah. So, so much just in this, uh, this one scene. And if you've been watching the previous episodes, we're not, you know, we're going through the movie scene by scene. So we're going to do uh, continue to do the breakdown in the, in the next episodes as, as well, which will be uh, uh, departing Caladan and arrival in Arrakis. So there's going to be a lot to, uh, to discuss there. Um, the last thing we have for today is one story uh, in the expanded universe. The Duneverse, books, comics, games, collectibles, and more. I think you had mentioned that, that Johnny, earlier, that, that like on Monday it was surprisingly uh, quiet. And in fact, there, there was one, one piece of news. And like, even though like I'm basically as do news net, I'm like checking the news the whole, whole day and making sure that, you know, we, we can cover things uh, as quickly as possible. That, that there, there was one story that I almost missed because it like was almost flew under the radar. That was that. Um, there was a uh, denouncement of Dune, uh, the official movie graphic novel. And to avoid confusion, this is a completely separate project from the Dune graphic novel, which uh, is ongoing series, like a three-part adaptation of the, of the book, uh, which was the first part was released last year. And uh, the next part is going to be released in the spring. Uh, this is basically the graphic novel adaptation of the movie. So like uh, using the, the visuals of the characters and uh, it seems to be more photorealistic. And apparently this launched on, uh, on Kickstarter and it got funded within the first, um, first day. Uh, but if you check out the Kickstarter, and I'll include the, the, the link as well in the, in the show notes, uh, there are some really interesting uh, extras uh, as well. 
Uh, I want to hear from you uh, first, Simon, because I know that you're you're really into comics and, and graphic novels. What what was your first reaction to this uh, news? It actually made me think back at a simpler time in the world when a lot of movies would get a graphic novel version. Like I still have my 1989 Batman Michael Keaton graphic <laughs> novel. So, and I feel like that's something they don't do anymore. Um, interesting that they went to Kickstarter. You would think Legendary would have been able to partner with, I don't know, DC Comics or DC Comic Imprint since they are Warner Brothers. What might be super interesting is if you still have your 1977 Star Wars comics, the, the Marvel comics, there are scenes that were not in the movie that confused the living crap out of me as a kid. <laughs> so maybe there's some scenes in here that are not in the movie. Yeah, and there, there's even one one tier, which is, I think it's the 2,500 tier where, where you can actually appear in the, in the comics. <laughs> so our, <laughs> that, that's that's going to be quite interesting. I was one of those kids that, that had all the 1977 Star Wars comics. In fact, <laughs> I still have them. And I just read them over and over and over. Granted, I was seven years old, so you can imagine I was just in, enthralled with them. <laughs> but what I'm most excited about, you guys, is here's a Kickstarter campaign, and they, uh, you know, pledged that they wanted to reach a goal of ten thousand, and right now it's at sixty-two thousand, right, with five hundred thirty-one backers. So here's mm. another example of the fans from the grassroots on up supporting something related to Dune. I just think it's awesome that you've got another uh, another piece of art, another expression of this film, of this story that's got all this support. And and I hope, I mean, I know Legendary obviously, you know, owns the rights to this and then the, the, the Herbert estate. But, you know, I'm hopeful that they'll allow for creative expression around this universe. Obviously, they have to have some controls around it so it doesn't get out of control. But I just love this indication of there's a lot of people out there that are just as excited about this movie and this franchise as we are, and they're going to express it and support it. Just back the $40 version, and it says 620% founded at this point. <laughs> so like you said, people are excited about it. And one thing I forgot to mention is that Bill Sienkiewicz did the original Marvel comics back in 84 the from the Lynch version. He's also doing the cover. There's other artists. One that I'm super intrigued, and I'm a big, big Tim Sell fan. Tim Sell mm -hmm. is mostly known to the average person. Remember that show Heroes, like in the early 2000s? He's the one that did all the artwork that that character was drawing. But he's also known for Spider-Man Blue, which my Spider-Man tattoo is based on. You know, he's worked with Jeff Loeb and Richard Starkins quite a bit. And like Long Halloween, that is a big Batman story, dark victory. So having a big name like Tim Sale, who mm -hmm. does not do commissions, does not, you know, <laughs> be like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll get paid for it. He's very, very picky. And for him to do a cover, that's a big deal. So that means he has to be a fan of this project. Pretty awesome and encouraging, of course. And as Garen pointed out, um, and I was thinking about earlier, the fact that it is doing so well already and just that there is so much support um, for what is such, it really is such a niche thing, like a, a Dune movie tie-in comic book. Like, that's just great. I think, you know, I, I of course, want to see artists, you know, making art and, and fans, you know, getting to uh, enjoy it. So... Yeah, I'm all for it. It's awesome. And they, they did make clear that although it's on, on Kickstarter, of course, the, the benefits, the exclusive items in the different tiers, those are going to be Kickstarter exclusive, but the book itself is going to be available in, in retail. So like, even if you don't back it now, but you want to buy this later, have the, have the hardcover, like it should be available, I guess, eventually in stores. It's going to be released in June 2022 next year, which is also close to when like the, the second part of the, like, regular graphic novel adaptation is is coming out um, but yeah i think like we'll, we'll definitely at some point like compare the two on this on this show uh, i i would recommend that like if you uh, if you are interested in the book and you haven't read it uh before like the um, i guess the the graphic novel that's already come out the first part has come out that that's that's a good good place to start uh because it's a it's a visual way to to get into the 
into the story. Uh, that's all in terms of uh, news for today. Before we, we go, uh, you know that sometimes on this on the show we take uh, viewer questions. So if you do have have questions, like feel free to like send them in the comments or like uh, tweet at us on uh, on Twitter at uh, Dune Talk Show. Uh, I did want to want to leave. We were mentioning earlier about like how Dune is is basically touching people all over the world. Uh, so we, we got one one nice letter from. Um, uh, from someone who who wasn't a Dune fan, but uh, but now now he is. Um, so his name is um, Moussed uh, Al Haddad, and he's from uh, Kuwait City. And uh, he he wrote to us about his his experience. So he was basically uh, saying, uh, I'll I'll read his 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 words. Uh, so I'm a movie buff in my late forties, and I always knew about Dune. I knew it, it was special, but never bothered to read it or watch any of the previous works done. All I know is that it's a space saga that has desert and big worms. <laughs> uh, last week was my birthday. It was on a weekday. I went out with my wife on a date to celebrate. At the end of dinner, she said, I have booked you a movie ticket. And I was like, but it's already 11 p.m. and you have to work tomorrow. And she said, no, you're going alone. You used to do crazy, <laughs> crazy things like going to a late screening on a workday alone. So I figured you would appreciate this crazy idea. And like he was uh, happy about it. He, had, he, I had no idea what the movie uh, was, and his girlfriend said, "Well, well um, or his wife said, uh, you'll know when you, when you get there. I left you a ticket at the box office." And then so he continued. I got to the movie theater and collected my ticket, and it was Dune. Now here's the big surprise: it was just for me. No one else was in the theater. You can sit anywhere uh, you like, said the usher. Uh, I sat down and said, "Please hand me the remote," or uh, ask, ask the operator to hit play for me. <laughs> So and then uh, yeah he, he went on he, he actually like uh, wrote, wrote a full review so I'll just r r read the the main part so he he said the movie was epic never a dull moment and uh, it was uh, he said it was epic cinema like truly truly like watching Lawrence of Arabia in space it has that type of magic I knew I was watching something that's uh, special that people will talk about for years to come it really felt like I was watching a novel come to life so again this this was someone who who wasn't a Dune fan before like they experienced the movie for the first time and. And they were blown away and yeah, have, have, have heard several of these stories, but I just wanted to share because I, I thought this was really cool. First of all, I'm jealous of the private showing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all have private showings in our little house with HBO Max, but theater? You married well, my man. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday. I was say. He married very well. <laughs> happy birthday. I'm glad that you watch or listen to the, sh to the show. Um, welcome. Welcome to the craziness. And if you love that, just wait <laughs> part two yeah that is uh that's amazing um and if, yeah thanks for for sharing the story and that's that's so awesome because not only like did he love the movie of course which is, is great to hear and he has an amazing wife but like now dune is forever going to be linked to this thing that she did for him and like for his birthday on this particular year so that's just yeah, that that's that's special, and uh, that's it. It's, that's what movies are all about. Okay, that's that's all we have for today. That's that's Dune Talk. Uh, so let's start with you, uh, Simon. I'm available on social as Dowdy, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Insta. This is Johnny Sobchek once again. Thank you all so much for uh, watching and supporting. This is the this is prime time right here. I mean, this is you know it's been out for a few days in the U.S. and many other parts of the world. Uh, I love all the responses. I mean, it's something that I've, I've been tweeting about. I just have like, was so uh, appreciative of all the, uh, not just like the great positive comments that I have seen, but like the people like that have reached out to me or said that they liked it or they loved it and like shared their thoughts with me. Um, I, I just like hearing the, the wide variety of experiences and responses. And I had a guy um, mention that he, he took his son um, and that he, 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 he was like, when it ended, he was like, there's going to be a part two, right? <laughs> and uh, they both loved it and like had a great time going to see it. And so, hey, now we can tell him, yes, there's going to be a part two. And this is Garen on Twitter at Dune Companion. And uh, I, I just love being a part of this fandom. I mean, just over the last few days, it's just been fun to be a part of this energy and the excitement and people making comments on, on my tweets and me communicating with them. And I just, I love everybody's ideas and you know, that this is an intelligent fandom. People really think deeply and have great perspectives on this storyline. So it's just fun to be a part of. 
And this is uh, Marcus Gabriel. And uh, I'll just mention when, when I saw the, the, the news about part two, I was uh, thrilled, obviously, because we're getting part two. But it also uh, means that there's going to be so much uh, news for us to, to cover and, and bring you in the, the years ahead. So, so really excited to, uh, to be here with, uh, with doingthisnut.com. And uh, you can find me on Do News at, at Twitter and Instagram. So thank you all and talk to you for our continuing movie review next week. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to dunenewsnet.com and add us to your social feeds. Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.